before anything else, I would like to thank uh, Professor Shiva for giving us our program today. So if you want to give her a hand. Oh. College Hour happens most Thursdays from 12.15 to 1.15, mostly in this room. So I want to invite all of you back next week. We have a College Hour um, honoring National Native American Heritage Month. And we'll have a program about a new report uh, that talks about Native students' experiences in California school districts, K through 12 school districts. So come on back next week. And now I will turn it over to Professor Shiva. So um, welcome, everybody. The talk is Understanding the Night Sky. So this is the night sky, right? I'm going to dim the light so you could see those. So this is a night sky. And by the way, sky is a sky. So day sky, night sky is the same. Why do we call it the night sky? Because during the day, everything is still there. We just don't see it because of the light of the day. So you, we only notice it at night. Um, and usually we don't have the luxury of looking at such a beautiful sky because of the light pollution. Well, with the blackouts these days, maybe we have, but if you do get to see at a sky like that, what are those? Stars. Okay, only stars? Planets. So can we tell which one is a star and which one is a planet? Is there a way to tell them apart? Are planets bigger, or like are stars bigger? Do they look bigger? How do we tell which, which is which? Also, are they all the same color to you? Like this is kind of yellowish. Some of them are orange color. Some are whiter, some are bluer. What's up with that? Are they all, what makes their color different? And another question, how far are they? So we have some of the dif distances to the stars, but who measured them? We have never been to the stars. How do you measure your distance to something that you can't go there? Like we've been to the moon and to the Mars at the most, and, but the distance to these stars, is there any way to measure that? Like how do you do that? And the other question, um, is there anybody out there? Like do you ever wonder when you look there, is there anybody out there? Because there's a lot of them. And the chance that we are the only ones here, it's kind of, Interesting. Um, and then, of course, the ultimate question of all time. Where did it all come from? Which was the question that for many, many, many thousands of years, the only way to even think about that question was through philosophy. Because the question is so hard, you can't crack the code until science became so strong that it started cracking the code. So these are the questions that every time that is there, the questions are also hanging in there. We don't get the chance to think about it because we are too busy checking our phones and you know, locking the car, running to the inside of the house. But if you ever get a chance to just stand outside and just look at it, and by the way, you need to be safe and you need to be comfortable. If you're cold, you won't survive there and you need to be sitting so it's comfortable. And you need to give your eyes some time so your eyes adjust to the dark. Um, otherwise, you won't see something right in the beginning. Um, so, whoops, so that's a night sky. And first of all, let's all realize the fact that we are all descendants of astronomers. Our ancestors were all astronomers of the early kind because of this. Because in the beginning, at the beginning of time, there was nothing else to be amused with. So the only thing they could look at was the night sky up, up, up their head. Um, and so looking for those questions is in our blood. We're totally entitled to ask those questions. My laser pointer is not acting beautifully. Okay, this is another picture justification that we are coming from a generation of astronomers. And this is the modern day. If you go camping, you'll see that. We're gonna talk about this later. Um, so I'm not gonna read that, I'm just gonna talk about it. There is something that's called the pattern recognition, which you are familiar with. It's a survival technique. Because if you are out in the wild and you're a caveman or a cavewoman, your survival depends on finding the patterns and using them. So if you see that the specific color of flower um, is, makes it poisonous, you stay away from that color, right? Stripe pattern on the animals tells you if they're poisonous or predators or not. 
So we, it's hardwired in us. We are um, evolutionally, um, we are hardwired to recognize patterns. But it's a two-edged sword. Sometimes it works against us. Sometimes you think you, you're seeing a pattern, but it's not really there, which is called a false pattern recognition. And this is an example. We like to see a face in everything, like cars, they look like faces, right? So obviously in the moon, we saw a face, and we know the face is not there. So that's a false pattern recognition. Um, or relating to your destiny to stars, um, also known as astrology, and let's distinguish between astronomy and astrology. They are not the same. So astrology is the way astronomy started. Like a couple thousand years ago, it was totally OK to think like that, because back then you didn't have a better explanation. But if you think um, your horoscope, when you read it, it actually it tells the truth. Just try reading a fake one. Like if you are born in June, imagine you're born in December and read the horoscope for December. It totally makes sense. It always does, because you are trying to find the right pattern. So if it works for you, you pay attention to it. If it doesn't, you ignore it. It's just the false pattern recognition. And so the other pattern that they realized is that sometimes they saw these creatures, these stars, um, in the sky, and they had a tail. Now we call them comets. And maybe a couple times after the comet came and they didn't know what that is, um, something bad happened. And they started find, trying to find a pattern and saying, oh, every time this comet comes, that bad thing happens. Um, actually, the word disaster, disaster, bad star. Like they would think some stars are bad. And when they come, they have a bad message that something bad is about to happen, disaster. Um, talked about that. So this false pattern recognition, we saw that in comets. Speaking of comets, let's say uh, there's this misconception, misconception about the comets. Who knows what direction this next comet is going? What direction is it moving? Is it coming this way? Is it coming this way? Well, that's wrong. What you have in your mind is a jet engine, right? Because we are used to seeing a jet engine, the exhaust is coming this way, the jet is going the opposite way, right? Um, but the comet doesn't have an engine. And I just remembered that I have to turn on the lights. It's too dark here. So I hope you can see. But the comet is not coming this way. Because the comet does not have a jet engine. It's not moving because the gas is exhausting from the other side. It's going because of the reason that makes every other planet move in the solar system, which is gravity, right? So the comet is not going this way. The tail is actually there because the, sun, um, the sunshine blows away the gas um, and smoke out of the comet. So the comet is really like the big piece of rock. It's, it wasn't that big enough, so it didn't become uh, round like planets. But there is some ice captured in it um, and some gas. And when it comes close to the sun, the warm, the heat of sun uh, makes the gas get from the other side of the comet. So this side is opposite the sun, not opposite the direction that the comet is moving. So if you look at it, this is the sun here. And every planet is going around the sun in these circular orbits, right? We've all seen the orbits of planets going around the sun. The comet is no exception. Comet is going around the sun as well. So the comet is really going this way, around the sun. But is the tail that way? No, tail is opposite the sun. This tail is this way, but that doesn't mean that the sun is, having a, is on a crash course to the sun. Right? The comet is going around the sun, but the tail is opposite the sun. So basically, the, the comet is going sideways compared to its tail. OK, and then one of the very famous comets is Halley's Comet. So why is it called Halley's Comet? So Halley is not the first person who saw it. Thousands of people saw it. Halley is not the first person who even acknowledged it. But Halley is the first person who realized that you can use Newton's gravity to explain the behavior of this comet. And he predicted, based on those formulas, for the first time in history, 
that this thing is going to appear again after 76 years. And he actually calculated the number 76 from all of those formulas. So this is the first time that physics became physics, like applied physics, not just natural philosophy. Um, so Comet Halley comes every 76 years. I saw that in 1986, and it was beautiful. It's coming back 76 years after that, 2061. Many of you will see that. It's a beautiful sight. Um, you know the person who saw it twice? Mark Twain, because he was born when it came, and then he saw it, and then he died. He saw it twice. So let's talk about the solar system now. Um, many of those things we see in the night sky, they're planets, and those are planets of our own solar system. So this is the solar system. We all know the site. It's familiar. Um, the sun is big, and it's in the center. I'm going to dim the lights again. OK, so do you see any patterns here, or is it just a big mess? So everything is going in these circles, right? That looks very good. And then these planets here, these ones that are closer to the sun are kind of smaller, right? And the ones that are out on the outside, they're kind of like all bigger, right? And most of them are stripy. And they have these rings. Of course, Saturn has the most prominent rings, but the other ones also have rings. And then this area that separates the two categories, the small ones versus the big ones, is called the asteroid belt, which is where asteroids are floating around. So this is our solar system, but of course, this is not up to scale. They were just trying to fit everything on one page. Um, otherwise, if you can see these planets in this size, they are so far away from each other, you can't put them on one page, not even close. So this is another look of the solar system. I think it's important that we know the planets of the solar system. So that's the sun. This one is kind of up to scale. Sun is the biggest. The first one is Mercury. Mercury is closest to the sun, and then Venus, and then Earth. This guy, little guy, is the Earth's moon. This is our moon. And then Mars. So see, Earth has two neighbors. On the inside, it's Venus. And on the other side is Mars. We have two close neighbors. Venus is the same size as Earth. Mars is smaller. And after that, you have the big ones. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and poor Pluto. So let's get away from the solar system. Another question that we have sometimes, or we should have, is what, why everything rises and sets in the sky. Is the sun the only thing that rises and sets? Sunrise, sunset, is sun the only thing? Well, it's the one that you notice, right? But also the moon rises and sets. <coughs> And if you um, get the time and go outside and follow the path of stars, they also rise and set. So if you know some of the constellations in the sky, which is a group of stars that create a shape, then they also rise and set. So everything rise and sets. That means everything is um, rising from this side, for example, from the east, goes up, sets in the west, rises, goes up, sets, rises, goes up, sets. What do you get from this image? Does this look like they're rotating around us? Because all the time they're going this way and then they come back down this way. So it really feels like they're rotating around us. It does. Which is why for thousands of years we thought we are the center and everything is going around us. Because that's what it looks like. Because everything rises and sets, right? OK, but then there were some other discrepancies. And now we know the reason that um, So we are the ones going around the sun. The sun is not going around us. The reason it looks like the sun is going around us, it rises and it sets, going around us. The reason behind that is because we are rotating in the opposite direction. So it does look like they're going around us, but that's not the truth. So here I want to do an experiment. So everybody, if you could please. Uh, put your arm like this and look at your finger. But look at your finger from the corner of your eye. So like your eye is tilted to the side. 
but keep your eye on your finger, right? So keep your eye on your finger, look at your finger, and now keeping your eye on the finger, turn your head to the other side. But keep your eye on your finger. Now do it again, keep your eye on your finger. Keep staring at your finger and turn your, turn your head. Again, keep staring at your finger, but turn your head. What does it look like? It looks like your finger is going the opposite direction, right? The same thing is happening to the sun. The sun is not going around us. We are rotating around ourselves. Now in here, it's obvious that you are rotating your head because you're the one doing it. You acknowledge that. For the Earth, Earth is so big you don't feel like the Earth. So that's why everything is rising and setting because we are going around ourselves and there's this axis of rotation. Okay. So this picture was taken keeping the camera shutter on for a long time. So it's a time lapse picture. And so the stars are actually going like that. This, this one is you know, rising and setting, rising and setting. And everything is going around this point. The point here, do you know what that is? It's a North Star. So this star itself is directly above our head where the axis of rotation of the Earth is. It points to a star, and that star is there. And because we are going around ourselves, it feels like everything is going around us, except that one, because that is on the axis of rotation. So I'm sorry, my pointer is not cooperating today. So this is the picture. So this is the Earth going around the sun, right? And then as it's going around the sun, it's going around itself too, like this. So this is the axis of rotation that Earth goes around it, and it just happens to point at that, that star. It's very accidental. So that star is Polaris or the North Star. That's the one that feels like everything is going around it. And that's the reason, because we are going around ourselves. So let's move on to another mystery, number seven appears in cultures, seven skies, seven this, seven, the seven days of the week. So why did we assign seven days to the week? In the, why is this number seven so important? Why does it appear? It, it, it appears like very mystical. What's up with number seven? So how many objects do you see in the sky that move? If you were living a living couple thousand years ago. How many objects do you see that they move? The sun moves because it rises and sets, right? The moon also, it appears at night and then it goes away, right? The sun, the moon. And then Mercury, um, Venus. You don't count Earth because you're on Earth, right? What's after that? Mars, right? Jupiter and um, Saturn. You, um, the other outer ones, they were too small. You couldn't see those with naked eye back then. So you saw seven things that are moving in the sky. Therefore, number seven emerges. That's why number seven became so important. And let's think about the, num the days of the week. Okay, so Sunday, literally day of the sun, right? And then Monday is moon day. And um, in French, it's landy. Um, so it comes from Luna, you know, lunatic. Uh, they related that to the moon again, like the moods. So Landy is the day of the moon, or Monday. Tuesday, again, in French that I know, it's Mardi, Mardi, or day of Mars, Mars Day. And then Wednesday, again, in French, it's Mercredi. I don't know that in Spanish. Uh, literally, day of Mercury. So what's next? J Thursday. In French, again, that I know, it's jeudi, which is day of Jupiter. Look at that. You see the letters of Jupiter there, right? It's a little different because of different languages, but it starts with J. And Friday, again in French, it's vendredi, which is, do you see the first letters of Venus? Day of Venus. Or you could relate it to Frigg's, the Germanic goddess, and then Frigg's day, Friday. And then Saturday, literally the day of Saturn. So that's why we have seven days of the week, because there were seven things that you could see in the sky that they move, and we call them planets, wanderers. 
Um, so that's the mystery behind number seven. There is really nothing mysterious about seven, nothing at all. Um, so let's look at solar system again. So all the scales here are wrong. We talked about it. So let's try to imagine what's the scale of the solar system. If you can imagine that you squeeze all of the solar system in this room here. So the sun is in the center, and all of the planets are here, including the outer ones, like all of solar system here, right? So we are shrinking everything down until the solar system fits here. Where do you think the nearest star will be? After our sun, not our sun. Our sun, we put it in this room. But where would be the nearest star to us? Out of all of those tiny dots in the night sky, they're all stars, right? Some of them are farther, some of them are closer to us. Let's imagine the closest one. Where do you think it will be if you can shrink down all of the solar system here? Library? Tahoe? It will be in DC, Washington, DC. If you can shrink down everything so all of solar system fits here, the closest star would be in DC. That's how huge the universe is. So stars are so far away. And that's just the closest star, which is like four light years away, which we're going to talk about it. So speaking of DC, this thing, if you ever find your way there, this is right by the, um, the mall. And it's very easy to ignore. But if you get there, this is really interesting because these are exactly up to scale. And they have the information of the planets there and the actual distance between them if you can shrink everything down so it fits there. But then you have to imagine this is like circular, right? Because these planets are going in a circle around the central one, which is the, the sun. So you have to imagine like something like the size of 300 football fields and one grapefruit in the center, which is the sun. Like 200, 300 football fields, all empty. And the sun, which is the biggest thing there, would be one grapefruit. And everything else would be like pinpoints. So that's empty also, how, how empty the space is. OK. The other question is, what causes the seasons? Do we all know what's the reason for seasons? Is it our distance to the sun? It's not. Because if you think like that, then Earth is actually closer to the sun in winter. Now look at this picture. Well, not this one. This one. So this is the sun. And this is in January. So this is winter. This is Earth going around the sun. And here, this is actually July, right? Summer. But see, we are farther from the sun. Our distance is totally not the reason for seasons. The, the reason is this previous one, which is this one. Because the axis of the Earth is tilted. So when you are here on the northern hemisphere, you get more direct sunlight, a bigger angle, which makes it hotter. Just like the same reason that during the, the noon, it's hotter because the sun is there. So it comes directly down at us without an angle. So that is the reason for seasons. Now, the solar system. There is something very interesting about Venus, which was our nearest, nearest planet, right? We have two neighbors, Mars and Venus. So um, it's also called the morning star uh, or the evening star. And it's, it's called Earth's sister planet because they have the same size. And they're kind of in the same neighborhood. So Venus is also the, the hottest planet in the solar system. Um, so why is it so hot? Any answers? Why do you think Venus is so hot? Look over here. This is Earth, Mercury, and Venus. Do you think it's because it's closer to the sun? Let's look over here. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter. So Venus is closer to the sun than Earth. But is that the reason? Because if that's the reason, Mercury should be hotter because it's closer. But Mercury is not hotter. Venus is hotter. So what makes it so hot even if 
And that's a rhetorical question, by the way. So um, why is it so hot? It's runaway greenhouse effect. So now a discussion comes here. So if you are a planet, your destiny depends on your size and your distance from the sun. So if you have the right size and the right distance, you're going to have a good faith, kind of like Earth, what happened on Earth. But if we understand this, we really understand the whole solar system. So why does size matter if you are a planet? So in the beginning, when the whole solar system was born, everything had a lot of internal heat in it, right? And the ones that were big enough to keep the heat, they survived, like Earth. But if you were too small, then over billions of years, you lost the heat. And when you lose the heat, basically, you lose your life. So it's kind of like this. If you, bring, if you put a potato and some green peas in the oven, when you bring them out of the oven, the oven is hot. They both have the same temperature, right? They're both hot. But if you leave them on the counter, which one becomes cold sooner? The pea, right? So potato, because it's bigger, it keeps the internal heat for a longer time, which is what's happening with big planets and small planets, right? So um, Venus and Earth, they have the same size, so they kept their internal heat for the same amount of time, right? But Mars, for example, is smaller, so it lost its internal heat. But why does that matter if you keep your internal heat? So when you have internal heat, that means you have geological activity inside of the planet, right? And that geological activity made two amazing, magical things happen. The first one is that because you have these plates moving and underneath there's a lot of turbulence and you know the magma is there and everything, you have plate tectonics. Um, first of all, a lot of gas that's trapped down there gets find its way out. It goes out with the volcanic activity. If you don't have internal heat, you won't have that volcanic activity and you won't have plate tectonics. And these gas, this gas that's trapped inside doesn't find its way outside. What happens when it goes outside? It stays there because of the gravity of Earth. It stays there and starts creating this cushion, this blanket around Earth that we find that we call atmosphere. So we made our own atmosphere. Every planet can make its own atmosphere if it's hot enough inside so the gas can find its out. Uh, its way outside and then stays there because of gravity, right? So this would be Earth and Venus because it keeps the, the warmth inside. Some of the gas that's trapped inside go, goes outside and it makes that um, atmosphere. And atmosphere is very important for life, not just because of oxygen that we breathe, but also for protecting you and keeping the weather nice. So. If you look over here, this one is Earth, and this one is Venus. And can you see that they're the same size? They're both potatoes, right? So what went wrong on Venus? These ones are basically geologically dead. This is Mercury and Mars and Moon. They're too small. They were like that little green pea. They lost its, their heat, and so they died long ago. And again, you can see Venus and Earth, sister planets. They're the same size. They're also neighbors, right? So. The other magical thing that happens, you've all heard that there is a magnet inside of Earth. So what, what gave us the magnet? How come we have a magnet inside of Earth? It's, again, it's because that we kept our heat inside. Because if you have a lot of, when you have a lot of heat inside, well, what's in the inside of Earth? It's metal. Inside is iron, right? And because it's very hot, it's like liquid iron. So you have a metal that's liquid, and it's very hot. So basically, it's like a hot soup mixed of ions, positive and negative, and they're moving around. So that's like electricity inside. Just because it's hot enough that it keeps the metal molten. Electricity creates magnetism. So we made our own magnetism because we were the right size, and we kept the heat inside, and the inside is molten. So we made Earth magnetic. Earth made itself magnetic. And that magnetic inside d does a wonderful job because the sun is not just all warmth and beautiful sunlight rays. It also has a lot of harmful rays that could kill life. And so they're all deflected by Earth's magnetic field. 
So you will not keep life on a planet that does not have a magnet inside, that does not have magnetism. In order to have magnetism in Earth, you need the right size, like Earth and Venus. Because the right size makes it like the potato, keeps the internal heat. Internal heat keeps the inside molten. The molten inside makes the mag magnetism, right? So you need atmosphere and magnetism to keep life. And atmosphere came from the Earth itself. Remember I told you when you have heat inside, that heat makes all, some of the gas that's trapped inside getting out between the layers. It's called vulcan, volcanoes. And so this is one volcano giving a lot of gas outside. And see, all of the gas is coming outside and stays trapped because of gravity of Earth. And it's just a very, very thin layer, right? So we made our own atmosphere. It came from inside of us. And then we kept it because we were big enough. We had enough gravity to hold on to it. And again, the magnetism. Now, why not Venus then? Because Venus has the right size. It's just like Earth. Well, there were a, a series of unfortunate natural events on Venus. It's not exactly where the sun is. The rotation rate was different. Some things went wrong. One thing led to another, um, like the f positive feedback. And so you had a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of Venus. And a lot of carbon dioxide makes it getting hotter and hotter and hotter, the runaway greenhouse effect. So that thing happened on Venus. Now, in Venus, there was no way out of it. It was a natural series of unfortunate events. On Earth, we already have the good planet, but we're putting a lot of carbon dioxide ourselves in the atmosphere. But we know where that goes. So next one, what is the biggest question you have about Mars? Like when, well, going to Mars these days, maybe. But like, was there ever life on Mars? Is there water on ice? Was there ever water on, my, on Mars? So right now, we haven't found any water there. But there are some mysterious clues. So this picture is taken from Mars. So I'm going to dim the light again so you could see that. And this is uh, it's like a big scale. So these are craters because of the things that hit the surface of Mars. We have these same craters on Earth. Everything has craters, all planets. The reason we don't see the craters is because um, either they are at the bottom of the ocean or they are covered with uh, grass and like a forest or they were weathered out because we have erosion and we have you know, snow and wind and rain. We don't have those. We didn't have those on Mars and so they stayed. But what about this one? What does this look like? It does look like a riverbed. There is no water there, though. No water. But what made it? This is a very familiar scene. It does look like a riverbed. And look at this next picture. This is on Earth. What do you think when you see rocks like that, rounded? River, rocks, right? They've been eroded by water. So this is on Earth. Now look at this picture. This one is on Earth. This one is red. You know it's on Mars. This picture was taken from Mars. It's a very familiar scene. Like it feels like this is on Earth. Like look at the similarity. Next picture. Would you look at that? This is Mars. It does look like Earth, right? And this is a scene from Mars. It's very familiar. It feels like, like you took it in California here, right? And Look at these layers, these parallel layers. What do we call them? What makes them the sedimentary rocks? If you go somewhere like in somewhere that's very dry and you see those, you're like, oh, I think this was the bottom of an ocean once, right? These, these layers. But then this is on Mars. What made them? So there is no water right now on Mars. But if you give these clues to someone like Sherlock Holmes, what do you think he would say? So astronomy really is like a detective work because we don't know what happened like four billion years ago, but there are clues and you connect the clues and you try to figure out what happened before. The next planet, Jupiter. I'm just going to talk about what those stripes are. Do you know what those stripes are? 
First of all, let's make sure we all know this. You can't stomp your feet on Jupiter. You can't walk on Jupiter. They are not rocky planets. They're made of gas you would plunge into. So it's not like a hard surface. These stripes are layers of clouds. By the way, this is like a giant storm that has been there for hundreds of years. These clouds look like they're there to stay. They're very stable. They don't go away. But really, this is how they're made of. It's just different, different um, elements, different chemicals. For example, this orange layer is ammonium hydrosulfide ice. And the blue layer is like water ice. And the yellow layer is something else. And so layer upon layer upon layer, and they create that stripy shape. OK, the Milky Way, um, that patch of white, kind of like milk was splashed on the sky. So galaxy, Galactus, Lactus. Anybody lactus intolerant? So it literally it comes from the word for milk, um, galaxy. Yeah, galaxy lactose. So this is our galaxy, um, that splash of white that you see. But is everything there is a star? Do you think all of these are stars or planets? Some of these are actually other galaxies. But they are so far away, so far away, that the whole galaxy looks like just a pin, just like a, a star. So one of those galaxies is Andromeda galaxy. And if you see it, it just looks like a star, a very faint one, an unimportant one. If you look with a telescope, it would look like this, like a patch of fuzzy light. <coughs> this is how you can pinpoint it in the sky. So if you go outside, you might see this thing that looks like a wide W. It's a constellation because it's a couple of stars and they look like that. The real name is Cassiopeia. This is basically some queen sitting on a chair, on a throne, if you can imagine that. So there's the story that Cassiopeia was this queen. This is ancient, this is Greek mythology. And Andromeda was her daughter. And there was some bad situation that they had to throw her away for some sea monster to eat her. So they put her in chain and they threw it in the water. It was horrible. Um, and then, of course, a hero came and released her and stuff like that. So this is the queen sitting on the chair. And from here, if you go down, you will see the galaxy, the whole galaxy. Now, this is, again, Cassiopeia. It looks like this W. And where is Andromeda? Down here somewhere, right? Maybe you have to wait until it rises. Because right now, it's behind this building. You have to wait a couple hours so it comes up. And this is our Big Dipper that I'm going to talk about next. And this is Polaris. But let's stay about, let's just stay focused on Cassiopeia. Um, so again, this is Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia. It's like that W, right? And Andromeda is one of these dots here. Again, Cassiopeia, that's the W. And Andromeda would be somewhere there. But look, this is the W. Do you see now the queen sitting on the chair? That's what they imagined. And this is Cassiopeia, because that's the, that's the queen sitting, right? And this is her daughter. It looks like this V, upside down V. So, and this is Andromeda constellation. Andromeda galaxy is somewhere here, right? This is the constellation, because it's a group of stars that look like something. I don't know what's happening, that this one is not coming. But look over here. Do you see it now that I don't have the dots connected? Do you see that? So when you go outside in the beginning, you won't find it. You have to give yourself a couple of minutes, first of all, for your eyes to get used to the dark. And then you have to look around and look around and look around. No, I'm kidding. If you, if you download this free astronomy app on your phone, um, there is a lot of astronomy apps. I have Sky Safari. It's free. I love it. Um, so you download it, and you put it on, and you're like, OK, I'm wondering where Cassiopeia is. You type Cassiopeia, and it tells you, like, go this way. Or if there's a star somewhere, and you're like, mm, I'm wondering what that is. You point it to that star, and it tells you what that is, and a lot of information. So you're going to love this, this app. 
But when you look at it, in the beginning, it doesn't look like much. But this is that W. And Andromeda is somewhere there. In fact, do you see this V? That's the constellation. That's, the, that's Andromeda in chains before they throw her to water. And that's the whole family. So the mother, the daughter, the hero, the whole thing. Now, there's something very interesting about Andromeda. Andromeda is two and a half million light years away. OK. But let's try to understand light years. So light year is what? Sorry? Light year is the distance that light travels in a second, in a year, right? So light is very fast, very fast, the fastest speed there is, right? So light travels a lot in a second. And if you wait for a whole year, see how much it travels? That's the distance you call one light year, right? So if something is one light year away from you, in a year, it goes exactly one light year, right? So if something is one light year away from you, um, how long does it take for the light of that object to get to you? Imagine the object is one light year away from you. One light year. So the light from that takes one whole year to get to you. Now I'm asking my question. How long does it take for the light from that object to get to you? One year. Because it's one light year away, right? If the object is two light years away from you, how long does it take for the light of that object to get to you? If the object is three light years away, how long does it take for the light to get to you? Should we keep going? Let's keep going. If the object is four light years away from you, how long does it take the light from the object to reach to your eyes? Four years. If something is two and a half million light years away from you, how long does it take for the light from that thing to get to your eyes? Two and a half million years, right? So tonight, if you go and see Andromeda Galaxy, you know that the light that's reaching your eye tonight, when did it leave Andromeda? Two and a half million years ago, right? And you see it tonight. You don't even know it's still there, right? Because now you are seeing two and a half million years ago of that, just because it's that far away. This thing never happens on Earth, because the Earth itself is not that big. Even the solar system is not that big. It's not even one light year. But stars are millions of light years from us, right? So if you see Andromeda, you are seeing it now. You feel like you're looking at it now. But the light that's getting to your eye started its journey two and a half million years ago. So you're looking at its past tonight, live. So every time you look in the sky, you're looking into the past. Because everything you see in the sky, they are so far away from you that the light takes a long time to get to you. So now you see them. Maybe the object is not even there anymore. How do we know? And by the way, Andromeda is on a crash course with our galaxy. Uh, but not a big deal, like in a couple billion years or so. Um, if we are still here, it's going to crash into the Milky Way. This is the other very interesting thing that you really have to see outside. This one is the Orion Nebula. So if you can imagine a person, Orion the Hunter, these are the shoulders, right? This is the belt. This is the sword. And these are the like legs, right? So this one, the shoulder, the belt, the sword, and the legs. This is really Orion the Hunter. This is what they imagined. So you have the shoulders, the belt, the sword, and the legs. Okay. So there are two very important stars here that I want you to remember. This one here, this shoulder, is Betelgeuse. It's a very big star. And this one here is Rigel. So Betelgeuse, Rigel. And then the next one, that's again Orion. So the two shoulders, this one is Betelgeuse. And this here is Rigel, right? These three in a row, is, those are the ones that you usually see. Like this morning around 6.30 AM, I went outside and I saw it prominent. This is a winter constellation. During the summer, if you want to see this, you have to wake up like 3 AM, 4 AM to see it. But in the winter, like at night, 8.39, you're just driving, it's there. You will see it. It's very beautiful. And usually, you see this three in a row. If you see three in a row, probably it's Orion, 
Cetyl 3 in a row. This is what you see. That's the built of Orion. So again, Betelgeuse, Rigel. And again, this one, Betelgeuse, Rigel. I'm getting somewhere from this. And by the way, this here to me always looks like a kite, like somebody is doing a kite in the sky. OK, so Orion the hunter was after the, the Greek mythology says that he was after these seven sisters. And the seven sisters, he was trying to capture them. And they were running away. And um, they were so upset, they prayed to Zeus. And Zeus sent them to sky to keep them away from Orion. So they are now a constellation of seven sisters, which is this little patch. Whoa, I should go this way. This little patch. This is called Seven Sisters or Pleiades. Um, it has different names in different cultures. The interesting thing is later on, Orion, according to Greek mythology, Orion died himself, and he went to sky. But then Zeus made an arrangement that Orion is always trying to capture the Seven Sisters, but never reaches them. There's always distance between them. And then there is uh, the scorpion that actually killed Orion. And it's another patch of sky. And they're trying to reach to each other, but they can't. It's very interesting. But then about this one, you uh, this is like a couple thousands of stars. And these are the, what, the big ones that you could see, seven of them. That's why it's called Seven Sisters. But really, the seventh one is very dim. So for a long time, it was like a test of people's eyesight. Really, you see six of them. So who knows? This one has different names in different cultures. But who knows what's the name in Japanese? There's a reason I'm interested in the Japanese name for Seven Sisters or Pleiades. Subaru. So if you see the car, look at that. You have the six stars. It's really seven. It's Seven Sisters. But the seventh one was hard to see. So that's why they have six in there. So that's the constellation. And about the thing that every time you look in the sky, you are really looking into the past. Even the moon that's so close is one light second away. Like the light takes one second to get to us. So you, if you see it now, you're looking at a second ago just by looking at the moon. The stars are so far away, you're always looking in the past, right? So every telescope really is a time machine because it keeps you, it, it helps you look in the past. And you're looking at something that might not even be there. Like a ghost. Very appropriate for today. Talk about it. But like the body is perished, but now you can see that. So next one is how do we find north at night? So this is the Big Dipper. I'm going to dim the light again. Sorry. So this is like one of those big spoons that you serve, like soup, serving for a lot of people. These days, really, this looks like the Amazon shopping cart to me. Uh, but basically, this is the Big Dipper, and this one points to the North Star. So every time you see this in the sky, you continue this, and it gets you to North. So if it's night right now, and if it's uh, pitch dark, I don't have any devices. I want to find North from the stars. I look around until I find this. When I'm facing this, and this points to the North Star, this would be the north. Then I can go north. And everything is rotating around the north star. Remember? Because north star is right above our head, I mean, above the axis of rotation of the Earth. So in different, um, in different seasons, you see the Big Dipper in different locations. But um, so right now, we are. Well, winter, you see it like this. And this one always points to the North Star. Now, do you see the Big Dipper here? In the beginning, you won't. But you have to really be patient. And then it appears. And so where is North now? This one, somewhere here. Right? That's North. Um, so um, around the time of slavery, I think, it was called the drinking gourd because it looked like a drinking, you know, water drinking. And it was pointing to the north. And if you were going to the north, it would take you to freedom. I heard that from someone. OK, that I told you. And by the way, look at this one. So this is the, the Big Dipper, and this is Earth. 
these stars do not, they are not on the same line. They are not even related to each other. But from the point of view that you're looking from Earth, it looks like they are making that line, right? They don't even belong to, in each one, one cluster. Um, they're just random stars. They just appear like that. OK. So the last thing that I want to talk about is the stars itself. So the stars are very different from planets. They are super hot, and there is nuclear fusion in them. So like our star, it's a very small star, insignificant. And the fate of our star is that it's going to become a red giant. So it's going to blow up very big, becomes red, red giant. And then it's going to have something that's called double shell fusion. And this is what double shell fusion is. So this big stars inside of them, there is nuclear fusion. They are making helium out of hydrogen. So they're all coming with hydrogen, which is like the lightest, simplest element. And they fuse it into helium, which is a little more, it's heavier, it's more complicated. And in that way, they create a lot of energy and release it. And that's why stars have light. They make their own light. And then after some time, they run out of hydrogen. What do they do then? Well, they start fusing helium into something else and that into something else. So they keep making heavier and heavier and heavier elements. But what happens when they run out of that element? So these mature stars really are kind of like this onion. They have layers. So when you're looking at a big old star like Betelgeuse, inside of it, it's like an onion. Because there is layers, and each layer is fusing something different, different, different. That's where heavy elements are made. Um, and our star is going to become like that. By the way, when it goes to the, um, to the red giant phase, it gets so big that it devours Mercury and Venus. And it comes, well, this is Earth. So in about 5 billion years, it's going to come here. Uh, we better move on somewhere else. And after that, it just, the star just dies, just lets go. Let's go of its outer layers. It sheds its outer layers. So this is the, the red, the white dot here. That's the only remaining of the star that this once was. It gives away all of those elements that it made in those onion-shaped layers, gives it out. And those, um, it, we call it the planetary nebula which is what this is. And then those elements go and become part of another planet making other things. So these are all planetary nebulas, these shapes that we see. This is the remnant of a star that died. But then heavy elements, where do they come from? So every um, iron that you have in your blood, um, calcium in nails, in hair, where do they come from? So they come from our mother, and then her mother, and then Earth. Where did that come from? Where did the heavy elements come from? We always take it for granted, and we say, well, it was on Earth. Well, where did the heavy elements on Earth come from? They were all made in that onion-shaped star, right? Because that's where heavy elements are made. But obviously not our star, because our star is not dead yet, right? So they must have been made in another star long ago before Sun. And then that star became the red giant or some other way, and it died, and it shed its elements, the outer layers. And they were absorbed here, and they came here, and they made Earth. So heavy elements are made in, in the center of another star that died, and obviously not our star. So every iron particle that you have, or every calcium, it came from another star system. Because it's not possible that it was made here. So this is not the regular um, uh, periodic table. This one, actually, it's color coded. Blue means it was made in Big Bang. The only thing that was made in Big Bang is hydrogen here and helium, and a little bit of lithium. For example, green means in a dying low mass star. All of these green elements, or some of this, it was made here. Yellow means exploding massive star. So all of these yellow elements, they were made in another star exploded, died, the remnants came here, became part of our solar system, made Earth, then we were born on Earth. OK, so I'm reaching the, the end of my talk here. Is there life out there? 
OK, first of all, how do we define life? Does it have to be human civilization or like humans? Does it have to be like one-eyed green Martians? Because life is not just us. This is actually the tree of life. And you, if you look at it, it's a giant tree, right? Bacteria, archaea. And we are right here at the tip, very small section of life, right? We, with our you know, cousins, fungi, and plants. And you know, we are just here. The rest of it is also life. So we are really not the center of life here, just like the Earth is not the center of the universe. But for a long time, we thought it is, and everything revolves around it. So we are not life. We are just some tiny part of life, microbial life. That's life. So we are no more the center of Earth's biology than Earth is the center of universe. So we have to stop um, thinking of ourselves that important. And also, all life here, even on Earth, they don't need oxygen. We are the ones who need oxygen. But we have found life forms that exist somewhere that there is not oxygen. And organic molecules are basically present everywhere. So you give them the right distance, the right size, <coughs> How many planets do we have? Look at these. These are all galaxies, right? And each galaxy has billions of stars. And most of the stars have their own planets, right? Now, this patch of sky that this picture was taken by Hubble Space Telescope, if you put a grain of sand on your finger and you hold it arm's length and you look at it, that grain of sand blocks a part of sky, right? This picture was taken from that part. There is that many galaxies out there, and each galaxy billions of stars. And most of those stars come with some planets. Is there not even one other planet that is in the right distance from its own mother star and has the right size, and things go right? So that's where you start to wonder. And by the way, this here is Betelgeuse, that shoulder in Orion. And the sun is here, and you can't even see it. It just writes sun. You can't see it. This is Rigel, the foot of Orion. This is Betelgeuse. And there are stars that are bigger than it. Thank you very much for coming. Um, for my students, don't forget to pick up the paper that gives you extra credit for this. Um, hope to see you again.